सो गुड मॉर्निंग गाइज वेलकम टू दृष्टि आई एस अकेडमी एंड टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट ऑफकोर्स न्यू टॉपिक एंड दैट विल बी अ कंपेरिजन बिटवीन बुद्धिज्म एंड जैनिज्म आई होप यू मस्ट बी अवेयर अबाउट दिस दिस टू टॉपिक्स सो लेट इज राइट ऑन द बोर्ड so of course a uh, very uh, famous topic very popular topic it is needless to say that uh, both these religions had emerged no they had originated in the period of 6th century bc right now in fact so of course you know that uh, when you talk about them so if i ask you a question that what they were how do you like to respond if i ask a question would that uh, would you mean by buddhism jainism what they, what they were why they emerged why they originated so uh, interact with us so what will be your answer any answer no okay let me then guys it is said if i say then uh, between these two there are of course that a lot of in fact lot of comparisons there are many scholars even who say that uh, jainism emerged from buddhism some say you no know, the buddhism had learned a lot from jainism so we have we, we have then two set of scholars and both keep on saying that one learned from others one thing so both of them had said almost similar things lot of lot of similarities there for the major part of their theories their philosophies you know lot of similarities there yet but yes some differences are also there that is why that they are they are being studied under two heads that is buddhism and jainism actually uh, if you see that uh, you know the first set of the factor will, will you know go for comparison that is both had or uh, you know the similar background both had similar causes of origin so let us say let us talk about their origin the point 1 for comparison when you talk about their origin then uh, i must say that 6th century bc is also called as the period of intellectual revolution can you define me the meaning of uh, intellectual revolution in this context can you you know participate even a bit say something why they are called as intellectual revolution okay let me i hope you should interact with the teacher no don't remain mum yeah that's good but the question is why what do you mean by revolution and then intellectual revolution Say. I say, 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 say in detail. Participate. When you participate, then teacher feels good. No, students are taking some interest. Right. Yes. Yes, that is. Actually, guys, you know the before the rise of Buddhism and Jainism. Yes, we know this was also the period of later Vedic period. No, later Vedic culture. i mean to compare that rigvedic culture later vedic culture then rigvedic culture was you know that more simple more pure and more society was more egalitarian it is compared to varna system had varna system was just evolving it had not crystallized it has not rigidified earlier even the you know the religious way we go to religious sphere religious practices were so simple so pure so inexpensive in fact but when you come to later vedic period then later vedic period had completely become brahmanical dominated yeah brahmana dominated completely brahmanical domination you see their society 
Brahminical domination had completely been established. You see their religion, religious sphere. You talk their religious sphere. Then both had come under a complete domination of the Brahmanas. Like if you talk the society or religion, first religion. Guys, earlier during a Rigvedic period, anyone was free to conduct his religious activities, rituals himself. Yes, he was at liberty. He could have taken the mediation of, he could have taken the services of Brahmanas also. And if he decided not to take, then he was at liberty to do. And it was well recognized and accepted in the society. But what happened during later Vedic period? During later, later Vedic period, you know, okay, that uh, the mediation of Brahmanas for conducting your rituals, your rites, your worship, worships, that became mandatory. That became indispensable. If you are not involving the Brahmanas in your performance of your rites and rituals, then your rites and rituals will not be considered to be complete. You not get, you know, it was the idea uh, popularized by the Brahmanas that you will not get the blessings of the God for whom you are offering the service, offering the puja, offering the worships, the rituals, the rites. And when the mediation of Brahmanas became mandatory, of course, needless to say, the religious sphere, it became very expensive. Is it? Very expensive. And it was almost uh, very much unaffordable by the poorer sections, by the common man. So common man was bearing the burnt of this religious dogmas, religious practices, the kind of practices Brahmanas had come to establish in society. Similarly, see that, you know, the whole affair, whole religious affair became the matter of, you know, that the chanting of, recitation of Sanskritic mantras, which were very difficult, unintelligible. No. So, the system became very much unintelligible. Okay. Full of, the religious system became full of rituals and sacrifices, full of rituals and sacrifices. If you go in detail, can you tell me uh, the number of rituals, uh, you know, Brahmanas had come to establish in society during this period? Any idea about the number of rituals? Guys, no need to count. Ordinarily, in the life of a person, minimum, there were 18 rituals were there, which were, very, you know, mandatorily, they had to be performed. No ski was from there. Since the time of when a, when, a, when a lady conceived a child, since that period, till you know you die, your shraddha and all that. No. Minimum. And besides that, there were a number of rituals. No need to count, no need to speak even. And more rituals, of course, guys, more income for the Brahmins. Brahmins? No. More trouble, more economic difficulties for the common man, for the common people. And sacrifices? Animal sacrifices. Guys, uh, you know that when you say, you must have heard about like, uh, one I am quoting, uh, that have you heard about Ashwamedh Yagya? Purushmedh Yagya? So there were a number of such Yagyas or such sacrifices were there. And if I quote in, you know, Ashwamedh Yagya only, thousands of cattle were being sacrificed. What ruling elite did, that was followed by the bureaucracy. That was followed by the rich people. That was further followed by even by the common man. And the Brahmanas had established rule that if you don't perform such rites, such rituals, you know, such ceremonies, then you would be declared as outcast. Right. And that outcast later on resulted into the creation of a new class. Later on what? Untouchables. The people who had been outcasted by these Brahmanas for not, you know, uh, living according to Vedic system, they were not those who were not within the Vedic fold, they were later on, they were declared as untouchables. And of course, untouchability, a great evil, a big evil of society, needless to say. So the earlier sphere had become very, you know, dogmatic, full of evils it had become. And not only that, when it comes to Vedas, then everyone was not allowed to recite Vedas, to read Vedas. The right to read Vedas were confined only to upper three classes. Of course, Shudras were deprived. Shudras were deprived even from listening the recitation of Vedas, forget about reading them. No, which later on which developed into a practice. If a Shudra, you know, if, if they happen to hear the Vedic recitations, Vedic, Vedic, you know, the Vedic chants, then they were given even severe punishments. Later on, it happened. 
So beginning was from here. The whole religious system was full of evils. One. When you come to society, uh, when you come to society, guys, then it's society again had become, you know, that uh, Brahmanical dominated again. Brahmanas claimed the position of supremacy. Now, see, first thing is this: uh, apart from Brahmanas, there were three classes. No, at the lower rung was Shudras, then were Vaishyas, and finally, you know, the second two Brahmanas were Kshatriyas. Okay. See. So, guys, let's start with the Shudras. Who are Shudras? If I ask you, who are Shudras? Actually, see, guys, uh, you're right to some extent. What had happened that when uh, during the Rig Vedic period, when the Aryans, it is said, as for Max Muller, uh, that he says that uh, when the you know when Aryans came to India, then uh, there was a lot of conflicts and differences between the Aryans and non-Aryans. But in due course of time, assimilation took place between Aryans and non-Aryans and many non-Aryan groups were assimilated into, taken, taken within the fold of the Vedic culture. And yes, many of them were accorded a low status. In fact, the lowest one were Shudras. It does not mean that all non-Aryans were, you know, branded as, you know, that as Shudras. No, those, those non-Aryans, uh, that, you know, the aboriginals here, who were, you know, who were practicing agriculture, some sort of trading activities, some sort of producting uh, production activities, they were accorded the status of Vaishyas too. But the people belonging to the lower strata among the aboriginals, they were of course accorded the Shudra status. And Shudras, Shudras are expected to serve the upper three varnas. No, so they were a servile class. Just imagine in a society. When you know the people who are regulating the society, they declared there is a certain class who will be a servile class. Its only duty will be to serve the upper three sections, that is Vaishyas, Kshatriyas, and Brahmanas. Isn't it an injustice? Now, I must say that uh, when you, even you go through some books, right? They will, they will, they, they write that no, the society was, uh, society during later Vedic period was more or less egalitarian. No, I don't completely agree to it. I don't completely agree to it because many reasons are there. You know the practice of the system of the concept of Dwij, have you heard? Guys, Dwij means double born. No? Double born, do janma. And, you know, only the upper three categories were branded as Dwij, that is uh, Kshatriyas, Vaishya and, Shud and uh, Brahmanas, not Shudras, Brahmanas. What is the concept of Dwij? That, that uh, the people belonging to the upper three sections, they are double born. Why? First birth, when they came into this world, and second birth, when? Are you, say something. Uh, yeah, so simple. Huh? So, when Upanayan Sanskar was administered to them, now when they had to go for you, must have heard about Yagya Upavit, Jane Udharan, that Sanskar was performed. It means, guys, that only upper three Varnas had the right to put on that sacred thread, that Jane, rest not three. It means one more thing that Shudras and women in general, Shudras and women in general were deprived from the right to education too. So, of course, this whole society had become really very brandical dominated, full of evils, and some and discrimination had started during later Vedic period. Of course, it is not found during Rig Vedic period, but now it had started. Secondly, when you talk of Vaishyas, needless to say, during a later Vedic period, yes, there were some economic activities were there. No, some economic activities were there. There was prosperity, uh, agriculture activity had increased. To some extent, some sort of trading activity had also started if you call off local trade. No, of course, uh, that inter international trade, outside trade was not there, but yes, some sort of local trade had started. On the basis of agricultural activity, on the basis of some industrial activity and trading activity, needless to say, prosperity must have been added to the class of Vaishyas. They had, of course, become prosperous. The Vaishyas started a practice of no, usury, usurious practices, it means giving the money to the people on by charging rate of interest. Brahmana said to them, Brahmana said, you know, ask the Vaishya, ask gentlemen, you charge interest from others, but don't charge the Brahmanas. No, 
brahmanas the you know the, the you know the supreme class so they should not be charged but the vaishyas took a in you know, a adamant approach had an attitude and they said if you take the money from us we'll charge you in return brahmanas started doing everything in order to discourage their prosperity economic prosperity no you must have heard a rule that brahmanas what they said brahmanas said no ki charging interest is like eating beef at the time no the cause were cause were considered sacred they were considered holy no there is written you know two word is there in the rig veda for for cause that is aganya that is not to be killed so of course it was a, it was an effort to discourage the vaishyas from practicing usury was from going from usurious practices giving money on interest the brahmanas had you know they made a rule that those who were cross the, the you know cross the seas those who you know who were you know that cross over the munj mountain somewhere in himalayas a hypothetical mountain you will be losing your of your your religion your varna your caste that kind of rules were made so it, so you know that this vaishyas were also feeling you know the brunt of this brahmanical domination and they were very unhappy one second thing a uh, vaishyas on the basis of their prosperity this vaishyas on the basis of their prosperity of course guys they wanted to play a dominant role an important role in political and social decision making but the question is were vaishyas allowed a role in political and social decision making answer is no because there brahmanas and kshatriyas there brahmanas and kshatriyas both joined hands not to allow the vaishyas to play any role in administration and politics so if you are a prosperous class if you are you know an emergent and uh, aware class and if you want to play some role and there's a class they are obstructing you of course it will result into some sort of dissatisfaction and that was there so so vaishyas were also looking for some alternative faith religion no where where they could have found some solace some equality some rise now we we'll talk of kshatriyas guys the uh, kshatriyas were also fed up with the brahmanical knowledge and when you go through letter with the text now if they go to shatpat brahman the kind of text you go through there there is a clear mention of a conflict between brahmanas and vaish uh, brahmanas and uh, kshatriyas for domination they are both both of they are saying that we are supreme brahmanas saying that we are supreme kshatriyas say we are supreme so both were claiming some sort of su supremacy and ultimately let us not forget that who were the founders of who were the founders of jainism buddhism and jainism needless to say that uh, lord buddha was the founder of buddhism and who was the founder of jainism real founder of real founder of jainism is lord mahavira no real founder was lord mahavira right so similarity is there ki the founder of both real founder of both were kshatriya no that reemphasizes or the fact what is said that there was a conflict between kshatriyas and brahmanas for the claim of domination over society who is supreme brahmanas ne kaha they said we are supreme kshatriya were saying we are supreme and not only that when you go through the you know buddhist literature there gautam buddha had said ki kshatriyas are supreme even lord buddha had to has to he has also said that kshatriyas are supreme so that clearly reflects of this ongoing conflict so overall all three were looking for some alternative faith alternative religion and when buddhism buddhism jainism you know that uh, this kind of faiths emerged they found an alternative and people in large number these all classes they joined this the churches the this two you know this two faith and kshatriyas and vaishyas became the big patrons of this two right now when you're talking about origin and the founders no when you're talking about origin and founders one difference is there difference is the founder of buddhism was no doubt no the founder of buddhism founders so founders of buddhism was no doubt gautam buddha there is no dispute over here but when you come to jaina traditions when you come to jaina traditions can you tell me who was the founder of jainism real founder we all know 
no mahavira but if i say that from you know that from which period started who started this faith of jainism ha huh, actually there is a concept of tirthankars no the supreme teachers there is a concept of tirthankars and the number of tirthankars were 24 and the first one was rishabdev and many followed 23rd was parashunath and of course 24th was lord mahavira right now lord mahavira was the 24th one now see guys uh can you tell me the period of lord mahavira in which period he existed he lived Huh? No idea. Okay, let me tell you. However, this is a matter of great dispute, great debate among the scholars. Some date varies, but on the basis of the principle of majority opinion among the historians, we come to conclude that he had born somewhere around 540 BC. He born in 540 BC, and he died in 468 BC. this was the period okay this was the period now let us try to find you know guys the gap between uh, parashunath that is 23 teacher and 24th lord mahavira is a gap of 250 years and this is on record so the gap between the two is 250 years we have concrete evidence on parashunath like parashunath belong to your banaras he was a son of you know the, the king of banaras called ashushain he had you know that he, that he got his enlightenment on some meth mountain these things we know he had added out of the panch shilas ya panch mahavratas no of the five the four was given by him while well, the brahmacharya chastity celibacy was added by lord mahavira four principles were given by him four shilas were given by him we have the evidence but when you talk of other 22 then nothing is known then jena says jena says you know jainism is an is an ongoing religion it has it was always there in my point so basically guys so they are claiming some sort of antiquity and the you know that the uh, authenticity of the you know the existence of these all 22 tirthankaras are under serious doubt and there is no reason to believe there is no reason to believe that you know there existed 21 20 you know 24 tirthankaras and the founder was rishabdev there is nothing substantial to believe in this just it's a, you know it's a parts of tradition and it's, it's there's an effort by the jainism to claim some antiquity so that they should claim that they are the oldest one so that they should have attracted more and more followers the background we discussed that in short we in brief we discussed the background for the origin of buddhism jainism if i said you did not take the point i gave you a message i said the gap between these two was 250 years so taking a minimum span of period on average between all these 24 find me a period when rishabdev might have existed calculate take any period 50 years 100 years a gap between the two take any at that time the, st the historians say researchers say even you know beyond that before that also the period might extend to they said you know aryans had come to india around 1500 bc right so so and history cannot be written just on the basis of hypothesis unless and until there is irrefutable evidences and arguments we have no reason to accept anything so so far what exist and there is no reason guys what they say ki jainism hamesha tha how could it be possible when jainism buddhism was a was a result of the reaction against brahmanical domination how could it be possible in the vedic period we saw ki brahmanical domination was not there society was more or less, more or less equal the varna order was very much mobile flexible varna status was not decided on the basis of birth rather it was on the basis of your profession what you do so no there is no reason to accept okay so here was a slight difference when you talk of origin
factor same but dispute on founders okay next point second thing guys ki how they looked at the world no how they looked at the world their view then both and then said both of them said ki world is full of dukhas no world is full of dukhas miseries both of them said they said ki this whole life is nothing but full of sorrows full of miseries full of troubles full of dukhas is there so similarity is there secondly both and they said ki why dukha is there both similarity both of them they said they said dukha is there due to our birth we are taking birth in this world to suffer the dukhas to suffer the miseries there is nothing in this world which can you know which can you know give us comfort or solace or happiness pleasure no that is momentary that is a source in fact they said that that is a source of ultimately in, in due course of time that is a source of trouble source of sorrows source of despair source of miseries so where you are seeking pleasure where you are looking for happiness ultimately that is a source of trouble source of dukhas both of them said they said ki why dukha is there why this is all the due to ignorance both said similarity both said ki we take a rebirth we suffer severely on account of ignorance ignorance means lack of true knowledge we do not have the true knowledge and when a person does not make, make an effort to seek true knowledge then he keeps on suffering and keeps on suffering means there starts the chain of the cycle of birth and rebirth birth and rebirth keep on going and you keep on suffering so what is the solution solution is when when you get rid of when you get rid of this chain of birth and rebirth you are liberated one both said yeah there is some difference i will will come in detail what difference is there but overall from a broader perspective we see then both both insisted on on solution so what solution they said self discipline both so very practically they identified the the problems the troubles a person was facing in their life prevailing in society they identified it and they 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 try to prescribe a method a solution where these miseries could have been ended and they could have been ended by self discipline and this self discipline resulting into true knowledge so when you get true knowledge it means you attain a status of perfect wisdom pure thought infinite bliss infinite happiness infinite knowledge so that is a state of liberation both said okay but when you talk about their methods guys methods the crux of the methods are almost similar but yes they they you know they vary in their presentation how they had to be followed there they vary so let us see one by one now should i rub it beta do so what solution they had given let us come to their teachings let us talk about their solution ki how they see at the world and what solution they had given and here regarding teachings will come one by one first we'll talk of buddhism then we'll go to jainism say on buddhism needless to say ki lord uh, you, you are aware about we are see we are not discussing here ki the details of you know jainism topic as buddhism topic no we are going for a comparison the first thing take it to be taken into mind see guys uh, that uh, one you know buddha was a son of the king of shakya clan ruling in kapilvastu so he was a prince of course he had been brought up in a very princely environment and his father what was his name because shakya clan so basically as he was that he had been brought up in a princely environment and his father had deliberately tried to keep him away from 
द मिजरीज हिज फादर हैड मेड अ डिलिबरेट एफर्ट दैट बुद्धा हिज नेम वॉज सिद्धार्थ था सिद्धार्थ शुड नॉट नो कि इन लाइफ देर इज सम ट्रेवल ऑल्सो इन लाइफ देर इज सम मिजरी ऑल्सो ही शुड अज्यूम दैट लाइफ इज फुल ऑफ हैप्पीनेस एंड प्लेजर द काइंड ऑफ एनवायरमेंट हैड बिन गिवन बट वन डे वन डे यू नो दैट ही हैपन टू विद हिज चैरियट हेयर नेम वॉज चन्ना विद चन्ना दैट ही टू अराउंड ऑफ हिज सिटी ऑफ हिस्स टाउन and there he happened to see something a lot number of things like he saw an old man he saw you know a procession of a dead man going on he saw a beggar begging on there he saw you know that uh, diseased person you know going for some medication sort of he saw some scenarios then he was confused ki still date what i saw in my life that was that altogether presented a different picture but today what i'm seeing that is all to different picture very contradictory to which is real that Which I lived so far, or this which I saw today, he got back. He had a discussion with number of people, his elders, the teachers, and all that. But nobody could give him a satisfactory answer. Even though you know that he was he was married he was married to a beautiful lady, you know Yashodhara. But even after that, this you know the kind of contemplation, the kind of meditation, the kind of this you know this quest for knowledge, what is the reality of life, did not subside down. And then what happened? He lives home, and ultimately, ultimately, after you know, after a travel of after a meditation, meditation of effort of around seven years, at the age of thirty-five, he attained the knowledge. So, what was that? After attainment of knowledge and enlightenment, what is called as nirvana. No, after attainment of nirvana, what prescription is he provides? Let us see. He says, he talks about four noble truths. No, four noble truths. Oh, truths. चार आर सत्य ही सेज इन द लाइफ देर आर फोर नॉबल टूल जीवन में केवल चार आर सत्य हैं एंड वॉट आर दे वन इज कि लाइफ इज फुल ऑफ लाइफ इज फुल ऑफ मिजरीज ना सो ही सेज कि लाइफ देर इज नथिंग देर इज नो हैपीनेस There is nothing like something called a pleasure, right? Life is full of troubles, full of dukhas, miseries. He says anything. He says anything emerging out of anything emerging out of attachment. Anything emerging out of attachment is dukh. Anything emerging out of your passions, your cravings, your desires, whatever you think, so th that's the kind of attachment is there? No. That to, uh, in, in you know in the word of Buddha, what I would like to put it as, you are sitting here, you are making effort to be an IS. He says that is the source of all the misery. I'm, I'm you know I'm lecturing from here, you know in in hope of some gain, some some gain, and that is also dukkha. He says. So people out of ignorance, out of attachment. they do something they pursue something bad but ultimately that result into lot of miseries he says this old age this uh, kya naam hai diseases this poverty your wish your desire your happiness all sorts of miseries so in world miseries are only there so the first thing is that those who want to reform themselves those who want to attain enlightenment attain liberation from this life from this dukhas then they should take into mind concretely that gentlemen in this life there is no sukhas only dukhas is there so when you happen to ingrain it into your mental into your thought into your mind then you will develop some sort of non attachment one second he says the second or uh, the truth he says that is ki there are some causes there are some causes of miseries so dukhas are there and these dukhas are not without reasons these dukhas are not without you know causes actually he had given a principle of he had given a principle of pratitya samutpad प्रत्यय समुदपाद प्रत्यय समुदपाद मीन्स द थेरी ऑफ हियर इन सिंपल वर्ड्स इन योर लैंग्वेज द थेरी ऑफ डिपेंडेंट ओरिजिनेशन 
okay origination or you also call it the theory of causation the theory of causation so it means you say in a simple words he says ki whatever emerges whatever is created whatever is born whatever happens that is not without reason that is not without cause so everything every event every event is dependent on some another event already taken place so it says he is saying ki one event when when any event takes place then event creates that event generates some effect when an event takes place that event creates some effect and that effect results in into the creation of another event got my point and of course the old event and the new event both are different and the new event is altogether a new beginning but here he want he, that he wants to say that for everything some previous event some past event is responsible so this is a theory of this is a theory of causation theory of causation you say theory of dependent origination or in sanskrit you say that pratit samudpad what buddha had said now let me put up in this context ki there are some causes of miseries to so what causes lord buddha had identified the reasons responsible for dukhas in life the factors responsible for miseries in life in the in the light of this theory of causation in the light of this pratid samudpad let us try to find now he says guys the the many he says i said now the theory of dependent origination so one that one that one event depended on another event that event depended on other so this keeps on going and this is how this whole life cycle keeps on going everything is related no as related to the previous event like he says so what is the reason of miseries he says birth if you know if a person does not take a birth he will not suffer any dukha so he says that birth is the reason birth is the main birth is the reason for all dukhas now the question is then why uh, you know why someone takes a birth why one is born why this this event takes place he says our desires desires passions cravings no he says that desires passions cravings of that of that consciousness in the previous life in the past life what my point it means him saying that if you are living this life and of course guys in this life we have lot of desires isn't it that whole affair is whole affair is a fair of desires in fact you are sitting here i am standing here it's all about desires no desires ambitions cravings passions so he says that these desires are going to create some effect in the going to create an effect and if these desires are not annihilated in this life only if these desires are not annihilated not finished in this life only then it will result into the creation of another life is my point so till these desires will keep on going the cycle of birth and rebirth will keep on going okay now he says ki why desires are there why desires in the, the impact of desire in the next life does impact or desire in the next life why he says he says that actually see guys you know the thing which you call as soul no the buddha called it consciousness buddha did not say that there is a soul who goes the who goes on transmigrating buddha did not believe in transmigration so yes he believed in rebirth he believed in rebirth but he did not believe in transmigration soul same soul you know that uh, taking birth again no he's not saying he's saying ki every new, new life is a every new birth is a new life a new beginning but how the chain is going on how the stream is going on from one life to another he's saying it, it in the form of consciousness consciousness of what consciousness of your of consciousness of your passions and desires which you had in the past life are you getting my point so whatever we will think 
its consciousness will continue in our next birth. Until that consciousness is not annihilated, is not finished, birth rebirth will keep on going. Now, he says, Ki how a new life, okay fine, that, uh, that we are born in the next life, but how that, that new life will come to know what we thought here? It might have got, are you getting my point? So he says that this is due to sense experience. What he says, this is due to sense experience. Sense experience it means, it means, of course guys, we have many sense organs now. Buddhism recognizes six sense organs. Six organs of cognition, he says. So he says, Ki our senses had, our senses had experienced some pleasure, some happiness in the past life. And the consciousness, and the consciousness of that sense, sense experience, consciousness of that, the impression of that experience that continued in the next life too. You know, he gives an example like seed and a plant. Of course, guys, from a plant emerges a seed, is it? From a plant emerges a seed, and from a seed again emerges a new plant. Correct, now? So he says two things: the old plant from from the seed emerged, and the new plant which emerged from the seed. Both plants are different. That same plant is not emerging there. Both plants are different, but the consciousness continued through that of seed. That seed carries the consciousness of the plant in the last one, last life. You know my point? So this is how he's trying to explain this one. So a person, you know, a life, a, a consciousness could, a soul could, or a person could have, you know, could have these feelings just because of sense experience, because they had ex their senses had experienced it in the past life. Now, why this sense experience was there? Now, why this sense experience was there? It was there because we had, we have organs of, we have six organs of cognition to feel, to realize six organs. There were, you know, the sense of touch, sense of smell, sense of hearing, sense of sight, sense of taste, and the mind, manas, mind. The six sense organs he has mentioned. So they, this, through these sense organs, we come to feel the pleasure, the pain, whatever was there. Our, you know, the, the result of, the, of our, you know, our cravings, our passions, our desires, and that continued in the form, that continued in the form of, from here we continue, guys. Now, that continued in the form of consciousness. Consciousness. Consciousness of what? The sense experience. The impression of the pleasure or pain, whatever we had, that continued in the form of consciousness. But how that consciousness got transformed into a life? He says, this consciousness gets into, flows into the, this consciousness gets into the embryo of a child in the womb. Okay? So this consciousness gets transferred to the, to the embryo in the womb, you know, that uh, in the uh, embryo of a child in the womb of the mother and that consciousness is the impression of our past actions. This consciousness is the impression of our past desires and passions, past karmas, past actions. Hear my point? Now, and this results into rebirth. This results into rebirth. So why this rebirth is taking place? Because of? Ignorance, because of ignorance. And how this ignorance could be dispelled? This ignorance could be dispelled only through gaining true knowledge. Right? Only through true knowledge. So here we see guys, this is like a whole cycle. No? It means from here, ignorance again starts the birth. The cycle keeps on going. And for every next event, their past event is responsible. So one event is resulting into the creation of another event. Clear? Eh? So this is how two things. One, so this is the explanation. This is how we can understand the theory of Pratit Samudpa, the theory of dependent origination. At the same time, we can understand ki why these, you know, these miseries are there. 
Got it? So, two. Should I rub it? Now third. So what is the th uh, third novel truth? What is the third novel truth? Miseries. Could be. Annihilated. Yeah, could be ended. Mises could be ended in short. So, the how the Mises could be annihilated, how the Mises could be ended? He says that Mises could be ended only if the cycle of birth and rebirth is broken up. See, same Jainism to say it. When the cycle of birth and rebirth is broken up, when that when that you know that consciousness does not take another birth, no, that misery is over. But how to attain that status? How to attain this? And that status is the status of nirvana, liberation, moksha. And how to attain that? Then it says, then one needs to control the passions. One needs to in this life. One needs to control the passions. And one needs to contemplate the truths of life. So, if a person could control his uh, passions, his desires, his karmas, his actions, then miseries could be reduced, and the you know that person could be focused, could be directed into right direction, could be focused into right direction. If he goes on. Constant and intense contemplation of the truth he attained. And what is the truth? That life is full of miseries. There are some reasons for these miseries and rebirth. So if you get to accept this, these facts, these truths, then keep on contemplating that, keep on following that, keep on controlling your desires, your passions, your actions, your thought and speech. Keep controlling them. If you keep on controlling them, then you can focus on the right direction. And if you ingrain the truth, contemplating means reflecting the truth. No, the process of continuous reflection on the truth that you gained. But how this could be done? How the passions could be controlled? How this contemplation could be done? Then here it says, the, here it comes into the picture, the fourth noble truth that this could be done by following, this could be done by following eight eightfold path. Right. This could be done by following eightfold path. And an eightfold path is so Please do participate. The, there is quite cool in the class, no? Don't be inert. No, participate. Actually, we are in the habit of interacting with our students. No, this gives us real energy. So keep on. So say it's very easy. So first one is. Oh, mujhe kya na padega? Fine. Then start from here. Koi nahi. First one is right view. Or you call it right understanding. Second is right resolve. Or you call it right determination to fine. Then you call it right speech. Then you call it right conduct. Okay. Then you call it right. Livelihood. Okay, then you call it uh, right effort. Then you call it right what? 
माइंडफुलनेस चिल गाइस देन द लास्ट वन इज राइट कंसंट्रेशन और मेडिटेशन कंसन this eight so this is a uh, eight fold path this is astangik marg in the language of buddha which will you know that uh, which will take you to freedom ultimate freedom liberation from all the you know worldly bonds attachments desires and passions okay let us see let us go inside so what is the right view first what is the right view so right view is ke gentlemen this life is full of miseries don't consider it that life in life there is some pleasure or happiness to no only dukhas and no sukhas are there in life the first thing then you need to understand the thing you need to understand the thing the what is the cause of this misery is the cause of miseries is your ignorance no few things to be taken in mind first understand i think no need to write first thing is ki you need to understand that life is full of miseries and there are certain causes of this and if those causes are removed no there are certain causes to these miseries of these miseries and this causes are removed then miseries are over and the miseries are there due to ignorance third fourth it could be dispelled miseries could be ended by attainment of true knowledge so keep these four things in mind it means you attain the right view okay clear now what is right resolve resolve first one is that you take a determination you take a determination you make a resolve that you are going to end these miseries no you are going to reform yourself so that so that one day you can attain non attachment so that one day you can attain true knowledge non attachment and ultimate nirvana so make the resolve first okay and three more things are here that when you take a right resolve also make a resolve make a determination of three things one one is ki you decide to abandon this worldliness this move my and all that abandon it abandon the sense of attachment infatuation first second that you make a resolve of abandoning ill will against anyone towards anyone should have no you should be, have no ill will with towards anyone rise above this leave abandon this ill will so first is renouncement of worldliness second is renouncing any ill will towards anyone and third you must desist from any tendency any thought to cause harms to others so rise above the status when you think to at at some point of time when you think to cause harms to others no abandon such a thought and these three are the main constituents of right resolve or right determination in my point okay now so basically you have to, here in the in the second stage in the second you know at right resolve you have decided to reform yourself not to move in the right not to move in the wrong direction you will you will you know make a hard effort to you know to go for non attachment you will not have any you will not harbor any ill will or any any thought to cause harm others if you have attained that then this resolve will guide your for the three actions this three if you have decided to determine to reform yourself and this this resolve this resolves will guide you guide your three activities one your speech your speech should be correct should be good should be true you should not lie no you should not hurt anybody you should not humiliate anybody you should not defame anybody get my point this kind of things this is all you know if you are doing this then you are violating this principle of right speech so right speech not only that not telling a lie that's not only the thing it includes everything no which may be interpreted in negative context you know my point no vilification this kind of things right conduct 
of course that your conduct has to be very good and to guide your conduct he says the five silas no five conduct and the five are what ah truthfulness second is keep on saying guys non violence no should not hurt anybody that is also sort of non violence the gandhian the gandhian concept of satyagraha was motivated from this kind of things of buddhism i think you know this so non violence third is ah uh, yes abstinence or it says no adultery no no immoral no Im, no immoral no wrongful sexual conduct or sexual misconduct you should not do that in any form sexual conduct misconduct like directly indirectly either doing or thinking to do hoping to do even hoping to do in the next life you know my point you must have come across that that after death you will find some good things and you will have a lot of pleasure in the next world no not you i'm saying you may find you may come across such people who could not have the things in this life they could they can think to attain the next life so in the, even in the, in the you know on the level of idea also you should not think you should not motivate others to go for also if you do that in any way direct and direct anyway a violation of this one okay it says not to covet the property of others no it means you should not try to take what is not given to you you should not try to capture it or to take which does not belong to you and you should not have an eye on the property of something of others no he says that is a source of big problem is it you can start eyeing on the property of others that leads to some bad karmas and the bad karma result into your this cycle of this bondage now fifth conduct he says that is what to to avoid intoxicants see buddha is said as a great teacher a great preacher a great reformer he saw some problems existing prevailing in society some economic inequalities some kind of you know wrong evil practices and simply he gave a formula that how those problems evils could be rectified okay na buddha always wanted to avoid any philosophical debates and discussions he was just confined to this worldly problems and how they could have been eradicated you know my point so very practical formula and he said ki truth is only that he said that truth is only that which your senses can experience which your senses cannot experience something okay like you know the talking of some metaphysics and all that so what your senses cannot experience buddha refused to accept them as a reality okay na so he says that this is how by this going conduct you can help yourself similarly guys the right livelihood no gautam again a uh, lot okay uh, mahatma gandhi has also said the means and the ends both should be correct and pure it means the first thing whatever you know whatever you are uh, trying to do to earn your livelihood that should that should also be correct and the met, the means and the methods you are going to pursue to attain that that should also be correct so to earn your livelihood you one should not take to any wrongful means some immoral means guys okay so th this is the thing now the fourth thing right effort why try right effort in short let me tell you right effort is it says ki see ki when you when you go to go in this life then your old habits your old thoughts they continue to persist with you before learning that this truths this this kind of teachings before learning before that also you might be in a habit of some evil thoughts no some evil habits okay first so when you are going for nirvana you must resist the reoccurrence of your old evil thoughts old habits must be allowed to reoccur one second you must make every effort that new evil thoughts should not emerge also so always be very conscious 
it does not mean ki once you attain knowledge and you get careless till you attain nirvana and even after that you continue to do that always make effort to avoid the old you know old evil thoughts and habits and practices and don't allow the new ones to emerge so make effort in the right direction mindfulness mindfulness says in one line in simple words i would say he calls spade a spade no and keep on contemplating that keep on thinking that keep on contemplating that it means it says that that uh, whatever you learnt what that world is full of miseries then keep on contemplating keep on reflecting it time and then so that it should be firmly ingrained into your mind which is my point so keep on contemplating it now it says call a spade a spade it means also that whatever you learnt your effort should be to attain detachment like call this body a body this mind a mind intelligence intelligence senses a senses and don't attach yourself with your body or mind or senses what you learned what you got to know don't attach yourself if you will have a sense of possession then it will it is going to promote attachment and attachment is going to bind you again in this vicious cycle of birth and rebirth and birth and rebirth so don't do that like his he give an example like so normally what happens that with the he says that that a human being starts loving you no know, his body his figure is it ye kitna sundar hu main but he says that should not forget no if you take out this skin he's got not me if you go for you know that dignika dignika has says this nika has said that if you take away this skin what will be behind will it look so beautiful if you take away the skin no blood vessels body parts no the bile is it so always keep in mind what is the reality of life okay so similarly if you that that don't 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 start loving your mind your intelligence nom nom we do that so whenever start loving that this is going to promote attachment and attachment is the source of misery got it now the the eighth one is concentration right concentration right concentration it means guys like samadhi meditation he says buddha has says ki when you follow and buddha has says ki follow step by step it is a sequence no normally you people are in habit of keep breaking the sequence no you putting it here here and there no he says to when you are following these seven steps it means you are free from ignorance it means you are free from attachment and ideally you have got to understand the truth after following the seven steps and ideally you are ready you are fit for entering the stage of samadhi stage of concentration in the concentration there are four stages to go into deeper concentration that is moksha he called it nirvana he called it nirvana to attain the nirvana uh, let me get on again so let us see here when you called guys uh, you know the the eighth one right concentration he says there are four stages in short we are dealing now in short first first one is first one is ki focus on reasoning and investigation about truths about truths the second stage is go for intense contemplation go for intense contemplation of truths right third is culti- initiate third is initiate an attitude of attitude of indifference and this will result into the fourth stage complete non attachment and perfect wisdom perfect wisdom 
and this is a stage of nirvana so stage by stage so the final stage of that samadhi you call concentration meditation guys so first it says that after completing the seven steps and whatever he learnt in the first stage of concentration he should focus on all those truths contemplate it and with the attitude of reasoning and investigation ki whether the truths you have come to know is it really true it means one is not required to be dogmatic one is not required to be rational rather, rather accept and learn everything very rationally you think whether whatever you learned is it being verified by worldly experiences by worldly events look on this if you get to learn that yes they are true then second you enter the second stage well he says that in the first stage when you get to when you get to go on reasoning investigation and you get to find the and accept realize the truth then you start enjoying a stage of joy state of joy joy out of concentration as you have learned the truth then second says that when you realize that this is true then contemplate it keep on reflecting it and when you keep on reflecting it uh, that reflecting the truth then you you develop a sense of not non attachment and that is going to result into further joy and peace tranquility you will feel peace when you start when you start enjoying when you start enjoying or taking a joy of concentration and feeling peace then you you are ready to enter the third stage and that will be a stage of indifference indifference of what indifference towards the joy which you are feeling indifference towards everything don't be bothered about don't 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 attach anything like even you don't feel the you know the joy which you felt in the second first and second stage be completely indifferent to everything and when you are indifferent to everything you got to have non attachment if you think that then this will be a state of complete bliss infinite power of infinite you know joy infinite knowledge infinite wisdom and this this is how we want to enter nirvana got it guys so this was the road so how he looks at the world how he looks at the self looks at the world and how the world is and what solution he had given this is it and now we will be coming to jainism so i mean uh, what jainism what road jainism had suggested see guys now when you could call you know come to jainism so how that how you know that lord mahavira looked at the world lord mahavira said that world consist of what consist of consist of two things he says world consist of two things okay two things what one is jiva and other is ajiva so this is how the world is one is jiva there is a jiva jiva means animate things living things and a jiva means inanimate things got it so this is animate living and this is inanimate non living this is right and what is this jiva one thing is so there is nothing the whole world consists of only these two things and nothing is beyond so first the truth you understand second he says what is this jiva the jiva is soul no jiva is soul so yes guys here it varies buddhism said ki there is no soul there is only consciousness which transfers from one birth to another birth he says ki soul is there and he says there is soul in everything even in tiny particles there is soul and it says he says that soul transmigrates from one life to another same soul trans transmigrates till that soul is liberated and freed from the vicious cycle of birth and rebirth so soul is there and he says soul is a conscious thing he says soul is soul is a ha huh, conscious thing conscious means 
means soul can uh, perform activities, soul can feel, can realize pleasure, pain, despair, wish, you know, happiness, sorrows. A soul can experience everything. So here a soul is conscious. Okay. Now, further he says that souls are of two types. Now let us see. He says again, souls are of two types. One is trasa. Other is sthavara. Trasa means mobile. Asthavara means immobile. Okay. Trasha and sthavara. Now, for serious immobile ones. Now, he says that Im, you know immobile souls, sthavara souls, sthavras or immobile souls are the lowest rank of souls. Is the lowest rank of souls. Why they are cons considered lowest? Because they have only well, they are immobile. They cannot make a movement, and they have only one sense. That is one sense of touch. So, asthavras are tactual souls. Tactual means they can have a sense of touch only. Lowest form of soul is there. Sabse niche yeh hoti. And where these uh, souls, you know, that they they are found, then the souls the souls are found in five places. They live in five places. Five things: one, earth, water, air. Fire and plants. Basically, he's saying about he's saying about microorganisms. No, microorganisms. He's saying about plants and trees. So he says that all these things, souls are there, and these souls are of lowest quality because they have only sense of touch and nothing else. Get my point? These souls. But Trasha, the mobile souls, they have the senses ranging from two to five. This is they have senses. Ranging from two to five, they are mobile souls. He says that souls. Are, there are many souls. He says that souls are of various various categories, various types. Every soul is have every soul is having a different level of senses, different level of consciousness. Their consciousness is decided by the number of senses they have. Got my point? The soul having more number of senses, they will be more conscious. So least conscious are this. Sthavras list and they are the most ones. Here there is also category like they are talking worm, insects. They say they have two senses. So they have more consciousness than them but they are having two, two, two senses. That is a sense of touch and taste. Worms and insects, and they have touch and taste, two souls. So they, they are better placed in consciousness than, the, than this Sthavras. Then says, uh, ants, the kind of living organism like ants, they have three senses. The sense of touch, taste and smell. Good, very good. Touch, taste and smell. Ants. Then comes the bees. They have four senses. Touch, taste, smell and sight. Then comes the birds, animals, we human beings, we have five senses. And the fifth addition is hearing. So we have five ones. Test, touch, smell, sight, and hearing. So those souls having these five senses, they are the most conscious one. They are the you know highest at the rank of the you know of the kind of the kind of the souls. So first, let us understand how he's seeing at the world. One, two. Let us see now. So basically, a jiva is all about souls. Souls may be of various kinds, may be numerous. Now a jiva. What is Ajiva? Ajiva is this physical world. No. Ajiva is this physical, physical world where souls are living, souls are occupying. Of course, we are also living. Na? So, all the souls, the kind of souls we talked about where they are, where they are living, they are basically that is your Ajiva. And Ajiva consists of, in Ajiva there are many, many things are there. Ajiva consists of Udgal. Means matter. Ajiva consists of Udgal. Okay. Ajiva consists of space. Ajiva consists of time. 
काल एटसेट्रा नाउ व्हाट इज पुदगल तो गाइस पुदगल इज एनी मैटर विल ही सेज दैट एवरीथिंग इज मेड अप ऑफ पुदगल दिस बॉडी इज मेड अप ऑफ पुदगल द थिंग्स यू सी अराउंड दैट इज मेड अप ऑफ पुदगल द मैटर नो द स्पीच द द माइंड everything is made up of pudgal so whatever you say around they are all made up of pudgal right the, mat, the you know he further says that this pudgal is having few you know few characteristics are there few, they have few characters like he says that pudgal means substance the matter so a pudgal is which is subject to pudgal is which is subject to integration and disintegration now let's understand what this subject is the so, pudgal is subject to integration and disintegration it means pudgal is made up of pudgal is composed of atoms so number of atoms get collected together they form a pudgal the form of matter lot number of atoms get together to form a matter so matter could be disintegrated again reduced into number of atoms so kind of theory of atomism right now he further says that every pudgal every every substance every matter every atom every anu is having four characteristics four characters they have that is you know that touch taste smell and color the matter which is non living fine so, so they have four characters touch taste smell and color rest guys space means the space we have, we have occupied this souls have occupied and of course there is a factor of time and this time keeps on affecting this matter for example mango is there that they explains mango is there so mango is a pudgal oh mango is there or any, or you know or a jug is there so the best example will be jug when you talking of pudgal jug will be there then they say ki that uh, the appearance of a jug could vary depending on where they are kept what circumstances are there let's for suppose if the you know if the if the room in the room on the table it is kept and if there is a dark light is there or you know that some you know very sharp light is there you know dark dark hai dim hai you know sharp hai darkness hai get my point so in every you know that in in case of this all kinds of lights are changing in all these circumstances the appearance will vary so basically the point is ki time also affects and brings lot of changes lot of movement in the matter get my point now let us get into so so what is pudgal what is life now he says ki ab what is the problem is there he says that basically this chain of life this chain of birth and rebirth this chain of birth and rebirth you know keeps on going keeps on going as no as due to the bondage of the soul okay ki soul jiva gets attached gets connected to a jiva problem what is the problem problem is the soul does not know and he it gets attracted gets attracted gets attached with the a jiva and keeps enjoying this association and keeps on going on so why this keeps on going because this jiva invited some the jiva attracted some bondage the jiva attracted some bondage of the soul and the soul soul got trapped why the soul got trapped the soul got trapped due to karma the soul got trapped due to karma karma are good and bad both is like buddhism it accepts karma as the two types good and bad both if you are going for a good karma it means you have knowledge if you are going for a good karma then it is it will result into your liberation you will avoid this bondage the trapping of the soul you will avoid but guys if you go if you are going for a bad karma then why this what is this bad karma so it says the bad karma is nothing they are the result of they are the results of forces of passion forces of passions and desires theek hai forces of passions and desires passion desires like you know that your uh, sense of love sense of hate sense of anger sense of infatuation mohmaya so if you again similarly 
if your soul gets attached to it, if the soul gets attached to it, then your soul is soul is trapped in this in this bond of karma, and like and the, you know the soul will keep on taking birth and rebirth, birth and rebirth. The cycle will go on. He says, ki the elements of this elements of this passion desires they are very sticky in nature. This love, hate, anger, greed, infatuation. Kya kehte hain? They are sticky in nature. And sticky it, it means that they are they are you know they are attracted towards the soul. They are attracted towards the soul, and they form a layer around the soul. They get similarly. The comparison is the thing is that they say that these things are sticky matters, and they get attracted towards the soul, and they form a layer around the soul, and the soul is trapped, and the soul cannot see across this this you know layer of this trapping. Cannot see across what is the reality of the world, and keeps on birth and rebirth, birth and rebirth. The comparison is. Like sun is there, sun is the soul. In comparison, sun is having the power to enlighten others. No, is having the power to enlighten others. Sun is a source, a source of infinite energy, wisdom, and all that. It says, so you know the layer of clouds and particles, the layer of clouds and dust particles, they form a layer on the sun, and the sun may start looking very hazy. Is it? Does it happen? If a sun, you know, if a, you know that uh, layer of dust and clouds come around the come, you know, come around the sun, then we are not in a position to see the sun. Sun is not in a position to lighten up the whole earth. So similarly, these passion, these elements of passion desires, they work as the clouds and dust particles. They cloud up this soul, and the soul cannot see across the reality. They say karma is very important. It say the karma in your previous birth decides the in which family you will be born, how much, how many years you are going to survive, you are going to live in the next birth. This karma decides whether you will be an enlightened person or a person or a person just involved in the worldly things, worldliness. Your karma decides. Your karma decides the amount of you know that attachment, that that mohamaya or the delusion, brahm. Is going to have in your next life. Your karma in the past life decides. Got it? Now, so this is the karma. It means as a result of this, the soul gets trapped in the cycle of life and birth. So, what is the way to liberation? What is the way to liberation? Guys, the the way the way to liberation the way to liberation is. If the if the impact of if the impact of this karmas are if the impact of this karmas are removed, if the impact of this karmas are removed, the karmas which is continuing since the last life, since the past life, two ways are there, right? One, to eliminate, yeah, annihilate, eliminate the karmic matter. Karmic matter, do these things. Karmic matter of past life, of past life, and second, second, not to allow, not to allow karmic matter these things, desires, passions, karmic matter, same. Okay, caring matter to trap the soul. It means don't first thing in this life. Don't allow the new caring matter to get around the soul. Are you getting the thing? Practically, try to understand practically what he had said. He don't allow the bad karma to emerge. The bad karma, bad thoughts will create into some trouble, and thus you know that chain around the soul will be strengthened. So don't allow this karma to emerge, and try to eliminate, try to remove the old karma is going on, you know, continuing this life since the past birth, since the past life. So both the things you have to take care of. Okay, now. So what is the way of how how they could be done? So how they could be done? So they say that these all things occur. These all things happen due to ignorance. Again, ignorance was talked by Buddha also. So how the ignorance could be removed? So they this, these all things could be removed by by following the three things. No, K, 
F A or simply knowledge, faith, and conduct. Okay, conduct. Knowledge, two aspects are there. Yeah, either one should one should strive to attain the real knowledge. Again, it's a detail thing. It's again it's a detail thing. How to attain the real knowledge? It's a detail thing, right? Time is going up. So, guys, they say ki an ordinary soul. They say ki an ordinary soul cannot think to attain the entire knowledge regarding a substance. I'm going to tell you. Actually, uh, Jainism had given the concept of anekantvad. and syadwad both are interrelated right he say ki truths are not absolute rather they are relative how see he say ki an ordinary soul and ordinary person cannot attain the knowledge about a substance completely they say that every substance is having varied characters varied dimensions varied aspects he gives example like an elephant is there and a number of you know five to six blind persons five or six blind persons are asked to hold the various parts of the elephant somebody is holding their trunk someone is holding one feet other feet the you know various parts so every blind person is saying well he is only describing what he feels when he is blind you are getting my point every blind person who is holding a certain organ of the certain part of the elephant he describes only that part he is holding off and he says that this is complete but actually he is not you know he is so blind that not in a position to see the entire elephant had he seen the entire elephant then he would not have given the description as he is giving now similarly rich ordinary persons are compared to the blind people here so he say ki to know to have the true knowledge to have the complete knowledge it, it is not the possibility for the ordinary people so it is it could be done it could be done only by tirthankaras it could be done only by the enlightened people the great people the great siddhas jainas jaina teachers is saying only they can so one thing is there whatever they say whatever they say they say simply you accept that whatever they have written whatever they have preached you accept that you when you accept their sayings their preachings you get you get to attain the true knowledge now and what is true knowledge right now we discussed that what this world is about this jiva jiva pudgal and the relations No, how to attain liberation? How this bondage comes up? So, but Tirthankara Sir made only after attaining knowledge. Ah, uh -huh. they became Tirthankara after attaining knowledge. knowledge. And when he has attained complete knowledge, and they are saying something that could be a source of true knowledge. See, Jainism says, I don't know detail, guys. Time is up. They have asked me to wind up in one and a half hours, and it is already over. So I have to finish. Right. A lot of discussions are there. The topic is very big. So time is really. i am coming to jainism says ki true knowledge could be attained only by three methods either direct that is through perception through perception it means the thing you get to know with the help of your sense organs no your senses your mind yourself second by inference inference it means when a knowledge follows other knowledge for example if you see you know smoke is rising above behind a mountain inference what is when you see a smoke coming above coming on the in the sky behind a mountain so you are seeing only smoke you are not seeing the fire but when you saw a smoke could you conclude that there must be a fire in the forest so this is knowledge by inference okay and third is testimony three ways are three, three ways to attain knowledge jainism says so perception directly attaining inference indirectly attaining aparoksha and third is testimony test it testimony it means when you know that when you get to read something very authentic very you know reliable some literature some scripture and if you get to read read something then you can you can confirm that yes this knowledge is true or when you hear hear from some enlightened people you no know, like tirthankaras when they say something then they are saying some very authoritative and they could be a source of the knowledge you know my point so that was said by them so you can have true knowledge on this on you know on the basis of these three ways right now faith faith says ki whatever knowledge you attained either through these two methods either through the methods of perception or inference or through testimony whatever 
you attained, you have you get to have faith on it. Just rely on it. And if you get to do this, then now you'll be entering the third one, then conduct. This conduct will help you to avoid bad karmas. This conduct will help you. This conduct will. So guys, these three are called, no, three ratnas, no, three jewels of Jainism there. Okay, and in the conduct there are again five silas, Panch Mahavrat, you must have heard. So conduct says here again the five silas, five silas ko kehte hai, Panch Mahavratas, and they are say, kaho, again, truthfulness, no, again, non-violence, right now, again, what? A stay means non stealing. Chori na kare. Again, aprigra. Aprigra means non attachment. Yeah, non accumulation also could be said non attachment. Okay. And fifth could be. Fifth is what? Brahmacharya. That is celibacy. Brahmacharya. Or chastity. These five things. Right? Aste means, of course, non stealing. Don't take what does not belong to you. Don't take what is not given to you. They say, ki when you take the property of others through wrongful means, it is equal to depriving him from right to life. Because the property you you know you you know, that uh, you have stolen from someone that may be very much important indispensable to live a normal life. When you you know just stole it away, then you deprived from your life. So it it is also kind of violence, kind of injury. Now, aprigra no attachment to this world. Again, attachment will again result into karmic matter, and again they're trapping around the soul. And say, it says till that layer of karmic matter is not removed. Till that layer of karmic matter is not removed, the soul cannot attain the liberation. Similarly, till the cloud and particles are not removed from the from the way of the sun, sun cannot enlighten the earth. Same comparison is there. So it says he should have no attachment to property or anything. And third is, of course, you have conduct yourself well, go for brahmachari, go for celibacy, no sexual misconduct. Has got me. Besides. Besides, it prescribes a number in, in conduct, it prescribes a number of practices. You should make every effort to, you should make, it says, you should make every effort to avoid injury to souls, avoid injury to life, being, you know, living beings. Like, when you walk, get my point, guys? So, in every way, you have to avoid any violence, you have to avoid any injury to the living souls. Like, when you're walking, no, you must have seen, ki Jenna's walk without any sleeper or shoes. No, because they fear, Ki under the feet, some insects should not come in and get died. That will result into the killing of the soul and it will result into some, again, coming of the carving matter around the soul and soul will get trapped. While speaking, they take, you know, they, 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 what do you say, they take a mask. No, they carry a mask around, around their nostrils and mouth so that while talking or while inhaling, no, the air, breathing, Microorganisms should not enter their nose or mouth and they should not get killed because microorganisms too are suspended in the air and they too have souls. No, they are tactual, they have tactual sayings. So, not number of things, guys, you know, that when you are when you are attending the, the call of the nature, be very careful. This kind of thing. So, you have to make every effort to avoid injury to the souls. One, secondly, that you should follow the you should, you know, you should follow the method, the way of dharma. Do some, you know, do some uh, good work. You, should, you must have the attitude of, the approach of sympathy, compassion towards the living beings. You must have the, you know, that quality of forgiveness, cleanliness, straightforwardness, non-attachment, sacrifices, celibacy. So these are the dharmas, practice it. You must develop the temperament. You must develop the temperament to conquer your pains and sorrows emerging out of. You must conquer the, the sense of pains and the dukhas emerging out of hunger, emerging out of thirst. No, thirst, yes. Emerging out of, you know, that heat, cold, 
shouldn't bother these problems, allow them to come. They say, ki go for self-mortification. Self-mortification, it means, uh, inf you know, inflicting self-injury, self inflicting self-pain. Like, you know, see, two things. To avoid new karmic matter to emerge and bind the soul, there is a way, follow this, this three path, and this one. But they say, and again, they say ki the you know the karmic matter which is continuing to this life since the last in the last life, past life, how to remove that? So there is one way to remove that is practice austerities, practice penance, practice self mortification. So trouble the whole, trouble the body more, soul gets liberated more. It is my point. You must have heard ki when you enter, you know, you must have heard about Kanam Haska Shwetambras. When you enter, you have to donate your whole property in the name of some per person, first condition. Second condition, you have to take off your hair with your own hand. Take it off. It is going to create pain, then conquer the pain. No, don't feel that pain is pain. In order to, in order to eliminate, in order to eliminate the carving matter continuing since the past life, they do. They, they keep on fast for a number of days, 15 days, 20 days, 30 days, 40 days. They don't, they don't, they don't talk, take water for five days a week or ten days something. They stand open in the sun. No, when the when there is a scorching heat, like Delhi, you have no. When you have scorching heat, you are op standing open, naked in the open sun. And by the evening, when you come back, you take bath with the cold water. They used to go clothless. Why clothless? The Gambaras, clothless. Why clothless? Because guys, clothes it means the clothes they, they thought the clothes used to you know the clothes help you to have some comfort against hot season against winters. So when you're clothless, then body will not have any comfort and more more you know that austerity you're you know professing, more trouble you're giving to your body. Your soul is getting more liberated. That karmic matter is being annihilated. The karmic matter is being removed. It is eroding fast. More pain you are taking. The generals used to go for self whipping. No, they used to take self whipping and extreme pain. They used to take out their nails this way. No, taking out their nails themselves to give more pain to the body. So, this is how, you know, that. Uh, so, of course, guys, the topic is not yet over. It's a really big topic. But this is the basic differences in, in their approach, in their attitude, in their philosophy is this. Fine. So, both sides state are different ways. In short, regarding karma, the, their thought on karma was the same. Both rejected the authority of Vedas. They said Vedas are not infallible. If Vedas have been composed and compiled by men, then it is human to or Vedas are not infallible. Both rejected the authority of God also. Buddha said there is no God. Jaina said God is there, but God is not the creator. The whole world is self-created, self-destroyed. And God, every, that everyone is God who is a liberated soul. So God is not above our Tirthankars. Our Tirthankars are above the God. Right. Both maintained Sanghas, the monasteries, monastic life. But monastic life was mandatory in Buddhism and not mandatory in Jainism. In Jainas, they had church, they had some Sanghas at some places and some places did not have. They used to live in Mathas, they lived in Viharas or some temporary apartments also they used to live. Buddhist Sanghas, they're in the rules and regulations, they were more rigid. The condition of women, the condition of women was a bit better in Buddhism. In the Gambaras, the concept is a woman cannot attain salvation, cannot attain, you know, that cavalry. And for attaining salvation, she has to again reborn as a male, only then can. Okay, regarding food. Fine, regarding food, guys, uh, uh, Buddhism, of course, both say non veg, oh, sorry, veg, vegetarianism. Both say, you know, no, they have to take absolute vegetarianism. Take timely food. No. Buddhism says take food before before afternoon. Jainism says take food before evening falls. Regarding Buddhism say, Buddhism says take veg. But Buddhism is flexible. If non-veg is offered, then one can take it. But in Jainism, no way you can take. However, this so, topic is so detailed. But you know, uh, since time is coming fast, it has, in fact, I've crossed the time limit. Okay. So I'll Take a leave, guys, and again, nice being with you, nice interacting to you. This interacting interaction was one way. Hope next time we get back, try to 
interact fully with the class you know this gives a fun to the teacher also thank you